Thank you, Steve. And I'd like to just say that uh, as someone who attends probably more energy conferences than almost any of you here, I thought the quality of the speakers uh, yesterday afternoon and evening and, and, and all throughout the, this morning was really as high a quality as any conference I've ever attended. And I think the, inf the clarity of the information, this is a very complicated area because we have such unbelievably fuzzy data. It would be fabulous if we could end up finally someday having data reform so that we wouldn't have to keep groping with connecting so many different dots. But as I, I was struck also by Bob Hirsch's last slide that the more you dig into this, the uglier it gets, and the more dots I dig into, I feel I ever find something that makes me feel better. Uh, I think the problem is getting worse. So let me basically uh, see if I can uh, quickly walk you through uh, where I see the issue of peak oil today and how to gauge the risk. The debate between the optimists and the pessimists persists. It's getting actually louder. Uh, the growth, though, in the uh, people interested in the issue can be measured just by the simple statistics of the growth of membership in the various ASPO chapters around the world. I uh, earlier this week went to P uh, Google and hit peak oil, and I got 3.1 million hits. Then I went to global warming just to get in, to see how that compared, and there were 80.5 million hits. So that gives you some idea. We're getting some awareness and traction, but we are infinitely behind uh, an issue that most people think is so much more important, and it's an issue that won't impact us for years, and global warming and peak oil could literally change our lives over the course of the next few years. There's a spate of new peak oil studies, the GAO report uh, that came out in the spring, the NPC report on facing hard truths that I'll mention in a minute, and then you have the other side of the issue of reports, basically the series rebuttal uh, on, on finding critical numbers, what are the real decline rates, et cetera. So the, so the argument is going on. Uh, on October 5th, 2005, right after Katrina and Rita, Secretary Sam Bodman uh, sent a letter to the National Petroleum Council and asked that if they would undertake the most serious study the NPCs ever tackled on assessment of peak oil. Uh, what it ended up being a group of over 1,500 people created a 256-page report. Uh, the website apparently has seven or 800 additional pages. And what I found quite disappointing uh, and registered my disappointment loudly with the, the, the senior people within the NPC is that the peak oil discussion in the executive summary, which ran about 25 pages, was this two-paragraph table you see here. And what the table basically says is that here are the arguments that the pessimists use, and here are the arguments the optimists use, and who knows what the answer is. Uh, and then on October 5th, 2005, right after Katrina and Rita, Secretary Sam Bodman uh, sent a letter to the National Petroleum Council and asked that if they would undertake the most serious study the NPCs ever tackled on assessment of peak oil. Uh, what it ended up being a group of over 1,500 people created a 256-page report. Uh, the website apparently has seven or 800 additional pages. And what I found quite disappointing uh, and registered my disappointment loudly with the, the, the senior people within the NPC is that the peak oil discussion in the executive summary, which ran about 25 pages, was this two-paragraph table you see here. And what the table basically says is that here are the arguments that the pessimists use, and here are the arguments the optimists use, and who knows what the answer is. And then they refer you to the, uh, 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 the, the, you know, the further discussion in the supply chapter, and uh, there are 19 paragraphs in page 127, 130 that say the same thing. So they, they, they dealt with a lot of the hard challenges the industry has to face, and they totally copped out on addressing anything meaningful about peak oil. And I think to spend a year and a half to get so many people involved was really a disappointment. In the meantime, there are a continuation of supply data points that I look at that point to many danger signals. I've been following this page that you see here. This is 11.1b out of the monthly energy report of the DOE. It comes out once a month, and it's basically world crude production. Uh, and what I've circled there is, the, is May 2005, when as far as we know, if these numbers are accurate, and they might not be, but they're best we have in the world, that's when we set an all-time crude oil record uh, of all time. And it's been dwindling since, which I'll show you in a few minutes. We've all spoken this morning about dwindling new oil discoveries, the accelerating decline rates, and the rising output of heavy sour oils, and the shrinking output of light Swede crude. And all of that would basically be sort of interesting and maybe imply higher prices 
if demand doesn't grow. However, oil demand still seems to be insatiable. This phenomenal growth we've had despite soaring oil prices uh, have been really astonishing to me, and the big risk we now face is that demand will soon outpace supply if growth continues, unless we have some amazing turnaround in supply. The optimists still loudly scoff at the peak oil uh, risk. You've, I'm sure you've all heard their views. It's ample resource endowment, 9 to 100 years of current use. Proven reserves can grow through reserve appreciation and yet be discovered new oil, and yet, it, as Richard Nearing pointed out today, even if they do, uh, his numbers in the low case had a peak, if I did my math wrong, at 93 million barrels a day, and we're going to be at 88 next year. Advancing technology will cover more oil in place, and technology will unlock vast, unconventional oil sources. The optimist caveat is actually spelled out, this is where the NPC facing hard truths did a good job of saying they're all above the ground risk. We don't have any below ground risk, and it's will enough capital be spent when it should, Will access be available when it should? Will R&D advances continue as they should? And will skilled people make the right decisions? The, uh, and then what I worry most about is that there is a chance, and a growing chance, that peak oil could actually now be past tense. I refer to this pay table 11.1b. Uh, you can go back now over 78 months of data on global crude production from the beginning of 97 through June 2007. And in that long period of time, we've only had four months, as far as we know, that crude oil only exceeded 74 million barrels a day. April 2005, May when it set the record, December when it basically bounced back. Uh, that should be a, 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 a two, by the way, uh, as opposed to seven. And July of 2006, when it just barely crossed 74, and as of July, as of June 2007, the number was 73.8. So we're 1.5 million barrels off the old all-time peak. Decline rates are a steep treadmill. The scarcity of solid data on decline rate has created sort of a fog of war. Some authorities still argue that decline rates are low and manageable. Sirius report this summer really poo-pooed any danger of rising decline rates and said through their incredible database, the average of the world is only 4.5% per annum. Other authorities uh, estimate 8% per annum. Uh, I was surprised that at an energy conference that we, our firm gave in Scotland, we had Andrew Gould of Schlumberger as the keynote speaker. And several times in the last three years, Andrew has used the number of, we think the average rate is 8%. He was asked about that afterwards, and he said, well, I don't want to go there. He said, I got the 8% per annum for, from Harry Longwell at Exxon. He's retired now, so I don't know what it is. Um, I addressed a group of the top 150 people at Baker Hughes a year ago from all around the world, and we talked a lot about, I talked a lot about the mystery of decline rates and these various averages, and I said, okay, of all you 150 people here, I'd be interested in a show of hands, how many of you think the average decline rate of all the projects you're working on is only 5% or less, and not a single hand went up? I said, how about around 8%, and about half the room raised their hand? I said, how about over 10, and about half the room raised their hand? Now, maybe they're just working on the really complicated projects, or maybe they know more than we think. Uh, but then I come back to a question, how easy would it be for the world to cope with an even 4.5% decline? Figure one that you see here is coming out of the CIRA report this summer, and what they basically show is if the decline rate's only 5%, and the demand growth is a little bit less than most people forecast, then we only have to add 60 million barrels a day in the next 10 years. Is there anyone here that thinks we could add 60 million barrels a day in the next 10 years? And then in the National Petroleum Council report, this was the table that basically hit the cutting floor as they were putting the final thing together until a several of us really protested loudly and said, if you got all these other tables, get that one back in because it's the, it's the bottom line scary thing. This existing capacity declines at a rate of about 7% per annum. Uh, the reason they decided to leave it out, they weren't comfortable, that was hard data. But if you then do the delta of what we'd have to do to get back to the top of, of, of demand, it's adding over 100 million barrels a day in 23 years. And in my opinion, I don't care whether it's 60 million in 10 or 100 million in 23 years, the likelihood of that happening is extremely low. And then I also step back and look at this phenomenal ph phenomena of we seem to basically be sort of maxing out now of crude oil supply at some place between 73 and 74 million barrels a day. How are we able to use 85 and growing? Well, 
is this funny gap that we've created between crude oil and how we top off the supply of primarily natural gas liquids and a little bit of refining processing and then finally a tiny sliver of biofuels. And it's just been interesting to see that that gap grow from 7.7 .7 million barrels a day in 1995 to 8.2 in 2000 to 12.3 in the first seven months, six months of 2007. Natural gas, gas liquids have had a steady and mysterious sort of growth. Uh, the, the, uh, but, but I think it's very important to remember that as mature oil fields decline, they cough up their gas cap. That wet gas becomes natural gas liquids. So uh, the, these, these are not long-term sustainable sources of steady growth. LNG projects, when they come on, also create as a byproduct some liquids, but it's hard to grow LNG projects. They're slowing down now. So the stealth growth in LNG, in NGLs, has masked declines in crude oil. So is oil demand actually our biggest single above ground risk? And I would argue that all these other demand risks, above ground risks, are real and they're important. But the risk number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, is called oil demand. Conventional wisdom has consistently questioned sustained oil demand growth. Many oil observers were certain that global demand for oil had peaked between 1990 and 1994 when we had about a five-year period of time of being stuck between 67 and six, 66 and 67 million barrels a day. That was the illusion of the collapse of the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe's oil demand uh, actually pure, perfectly offsetting the steady growth of everyone else in the world. And then finally that came to a halt, and in 1995 the world crossed 70 million barrels a day for the first time in global history. And basically once we broke through that ceiling, we just kept going. The Asian flu barely stopped the train, 9-11 had only a diminutive impact, several warm winters simply slowed down fast-paced growth. Was it China that everybody missed? Or can oil demand growth ever stop? So let's spend just a few minutes questioning, is growth in oil demand sustainable? And then turn the question around, how would you actually start putting the brakes on it if, in fact, supply can't keep pace? Most economists fret about continuation of growth, and they, all, but, and they also presume supply is about to surge. Many have been convinced for decades that high prices would kill further growth, but they believe that at $30, they believe it at $40, they believe it at $50. Uh, there has been no sign that high prices have had any impact yet on demand. Uh, many question the sustainability of China's growth. Back in the summer of 2004, China is about to have a hard landing. It became current sort of energy wisdom convinced that don't, don't trust China. Others point to the stagnant or falling demand in Germany and Japan to say that's going to spread around the world, but so far it hasn't. And I look back on oil demand and say one of the remarkable things, in my opinion, is that it was the 20th century's most enduring event. In 1900, we don't have any good numbers for how much oil we were using, but it might well be a number of around 100,000 barrels a day, and it was primarily used for lighting and Vaseline. By tw 1920, we just finished the war, oil demand had grown to an astonishing 1.5 million barrels a day. By 1950, it was 10.4. By 1980, it was 59.3. Uh, by 2000, we had already grown in between 95 and 2000 from 70 to 76, and by 2006, we were at 84. So between 1920 and 2006, we had an average am compound annual growth of 4.8% per year, and we had something like about nine years out of that long series when oil demand didn't grow. The recent rise in oil demand is not just China. It's actually every place. Here are the numbers between 92 and 2006 when we added 16.9 million barrels a day more oil use, and that was actually held back by the, by the collapse of the former Soviet Union. Had the former Soviet Union stayed flat, that number would have been over 20. And then we have 2005 through estimated 2008 when we basically uh, uh, add another 4.5 million barrels a day, and if you look at the increases there, they're coming right across the board from every part of the world. Oil demand outside the OECD is, is, is growing fast. Um, here are all the key numbers coming out of the IEA's database between 2001 and 2006. And when you, start, when you get consistent double-digit uh, in a five-year period of time, double-digit growth, these are really stout. That basically turns out to average 3.1% per annum. 
The OECD demand has been a mixed bag, the many moving parts, but look at the United States of America with, with basically a, a 5% change, but basically it's 1 1, over 1 million barrels a day in five years. That's a really a lot of oil to tax our system. Where does the recent projected growth come from? I'm just going to show you the numbers in the fourth quarter of 2006 versus the fourth quarter estimate next year of 2008 when we, the IA has us nudging almost to 90 million barrels a day. And the growth is basically coming from all around the world. What's interesting is that cumulative increase, if it turns out to occur in a, in a two-year period of time, is equal to 90% of the total amount of the oil that the United States of America now produces. So these are powerful numbers. And all serious demand forecasts assume continued growth. The, the IEA, the EIA, the World Bank, the United Nations, they've all basically taken a very serious crack at what will oil demand need to be. And they basically look at population, and interestingly enough, they assume by, across the board that population growth will be slower in the next 20 years than it was the last 20. They look at vehicle registrations, et cetera, et cetera, and they come up with this astonishing increase uh, in, in total energy and an increase of about 50% in oil. And, and essentially, 50% uh, of the total growth in energy demand is coming from their assumption of growth in transportation fuels, and basically that's all oil. And so the question this raises is, can that really happen, and does it need to happen? And underline that as a basic question of, are 6.4, 6.5 billion people too many? and are 894 million vehicles enough? Why transportation energy is so difficult to stop is that the world is now producing 50 million vehicles per year, and that global vehicle registration is now almost 900 million, and the global population is 6.5 billion. But look at the disparity. If you take North America and you look at the per capita vehicle ownership, for every 1,000 people, we have an average of 641 cars. And that's held down enormously by Mexico's numbers. If you look at the total OECD, it's 534 cars per 1,000 people. You drop down to the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, and it's 182, but that's going to change very rapidly. If you look at China, it's an astonishing 18 per 1,000 people. Uh, 18 per 1,000 people compared to our average United States of about almost 800 per per th cars per 1,000. And then the interesting rest of the world, this funny 3.6 billion people who, only, who on average have 51 cars per 1,000 people. So this is what makes the long-term demand forecast for continued oil growth so daunting and so, and so hard to see how we're going to bring that to a stop. Creating mobility just frankly uses more oil. Uh, these are just some interesting what-if numbers. If the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe's vehicle use rises to Western Europe, how much oil do we add? 11 million barrels a day. If China's vehicle use rises to the levels today of the SFU in Eastern Europe, 26 million barrels a day. If the rest of the world's vehicle use rises to the FSU levels today, another 24 million barrels a day. So the impact of these relatively modest assumptions would basically require 61 million barrels a day of additional oil. Could any one of these changes be supplied? And I would say realistically, I don't think so. So oil demand is not likely to slow down or decline. It turns out that oil demand on a short-term basis is unbelievably fickle. It can slow temporarily, year over year, quarter over quarter. Uh, it has a little bit of seasonality, always has. It can slow in certain parts of the world. When we had the Asian flu, that did knock about eight countries into, into negative demand for about 18 months. Weather can dampen demand growth. Uh, but the fundamental growth engine appears to me to be literally unstoppable on the blueprint that we've created for the world. The big question is, can supply keep pace? It turns out that supply and demand for oil have no relationship to one another. The, the right hand literally doesn't know the left hand. Growing supply is not fickle. It takes a relentless effort. Chris this morning commented about the 6.5 years on average that it takes a project to get developed. Look at the projects today that are basically now announcing a three-year delay, a five-year delay, a 10-year delay. We've run out of everything, and so that's going to get harder and harder to bring on supplies. And then so quickly after the new projects come on, the declines start, uh, and, and then we're back to the treadmill. If demand growth could be supplied, let's assume that basically we have ample resources and we make them all available. 
It will require a vast amount of E&P spending that translates into a vast amount of physical activity. Drilling activity would need to soar, and since we're using every high-quality rig in the world today, that rig would require a massive amount of new rigs being built. Energy infrastructure needs a rapid expansion, but at the same time, our energy infrastructure is so rusty that we have to rebuild our current system at the same time. Our people scarcity, which is a genuine crisis today, needs a very fast resolution, and I'm not sure how that works. And massive spending needs to happen ASAP. And I look at that list and say, I don't think any one of those are particularly likely events to happen. Meanwhile, how secure is our current supply? Well, to really honestly answer that, you'd have to answer the following questions. How fast are most producing fields currently declining? Are these decline rates stable, or are they accelerating? How robust is our deep water play, which has certainly been the last great horizon? Uh, are any new frontiers to be found, and if so, when? Will the trend of dwindling size of new fields continue, or will we reverse that? And are most mature supergiant fields in the Middle East, where we have an utter lack of any accurate field-by-field -field production data, now actually in decline? Here's a profile of uh, about 18 North Sea fields that were taken about three years ago out of Saga Petroleum's report. These are all fields they had ownership in. And I was just struck by the similarity of the decline profile of every one of these fields. Uh, this is why, by basically, the North Sea peaked in 1999 and is off by close to 50% in the next seven years. This, this graph, though, was a real surprise to me when I finally gathered this data together. These are basically our 10 key deep water fields that came on in the, in the sort of you know, last seven years. Uh, you've got Grand Pal, Pompano, Hoover, Genesis, Europa, Brutus, Boomvang, Ursa, Mars, and Augur. Ursa and Mars collectively, as, as, uh, as referred to this morning, is the largest producing oil field in, in, in the Gulf of Mexico. But it's also interesting to see that these two fields collectively produced 362,000 barrels a day in 2001. And by 2007, they're down to 132,000. The other eight fields peaked in various years but at the peak, they produced almost 400,000 barrels a day, 397,000. And as of the first half of 2007, they're down to 110. And when you divide the 110 into the eight fields, the average production is 13,000 barrels a field. To see a field like Augur, I remember when that came on, and it seemed so monstrous, or Ram Pal, basically now be down to, Augur's now to 14,000 barrels a day. Uh, uh, Ram Pal is down to 12,000 barrels a day. It took five years for these fields to go from peak to basically 20% of, of what they peaked. And this same production profile, I'm told, with some good authorities, will be exactly what we experience in the deep water in West Africa, in Angola and Nigeria. Uh, we're basically doing just-in-time production to make the IRRs work on deep water production. Then I step back and look at sort of just some interesting macro statistics. And these all come out of the Oil and Gas Journal's worldwide production report that they publish about the end of each year. These are December 18, 2006. If you just take their country by country numbers and look at what they have as production in 2006 versus 2005, they're reporting on 78 countries that produce all of the world's crude oil. And basically, 43 of those countries, this is not volume weighted, this is just statistical, uh, actually declined between those two years, and the average decline rate was 6.7%, and 35 grew, and the average growth was 6.8%. I'd feel a lot better if it were 43 growing and 35 declining. Once you start getting behind the S-curve, uh, it ju it's just the law of numbers. Then I went back to the 44 pages in the same report out of curiosity. Uh, I was actually at a board meeting and sort of bored, so I had on my lap and doing all this. And I said, it's interesting, uh, in their database, uh, they basically accumulate all the U.S. figures on, by state by state, because we have basically 37, 36,000 oil fields in the United States. And in Russia, they only report their production by company as opposed to field. But in every other country, they have field by field of all the fields in production. It's a da database of about 44,000 fields. And I went through, because after each field name, they have discovery date. And I underlined all of the fields that had been discovered since 2000. And to my astonishment, when I added them up, there were only 42. None are large fields. Quite a few don't have production reports, but basically about, about 25 of the 42 do, and the cumulative production 
of, the, of those fields in 2006 was an astonishing 27,000 barrels a day. There were no new discoveries in Norway. Angola had one. Brazil had one. The UK had six tiny fields that averaged in 2006 about 2,000 barrels a day. Nigeria had three. Colombia had two. So I took all these key countries and said, let's just go back and see how many how many fields are in the database that were discovered between 1990 and 94, and it turned out to be 143. And I said, how about between 95 and 99, and it was 102, and then 25 in 2000, 2005. Now, there's a likelihood the oil and gas journal could have missed a few, but uh, missed many big fields? I don't think so. I found that absolutely astonishing. Then, basically, uh, there's a snapshot of key oil producers shrinking discoveries. Whoops. Uh, the, uh, then the question is, does the world really have a safe supply cushion? Conventional wisdom assumes global spare capacity today is somewhere between 2 and 4 million barrels a day, and there's some that basically toss numbers out of their 6 or 7 million barrels a day. Uh, What's, what's missing in these lists is any list of the individual fields that people assume that capacity is coming from. Most of this, of the 2 to 4 million barrels a day, is presumed to be Saudi Arabia's 11.3 million barrel a day capacity. That's the number that they continue to publish. The IA uses that. Uh, current Saudi production is assumed to be 8.6 million barrels a day. So implied within that is that they could basically quite easily go back to 11.3 if the world really needed more oil. Uh, Saudi Arabia is in the middle of a massive, the biggest amount of money they've ever spent. Uh, you know, the numbers range, the, 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 uh, the official numbers within Saudi Aramco are $54 billion on these fields they're rehabilitating. Uh, but what they're basically saying is by the end of 2009, all but one will be done and they will have increased their productive capacity to 12.5 million barrels a day. And they also acknowledge that some of that is to replace declines taking place in their mature fields. Well, if you do the math, and they have 11.3 today, and they're adding four, they're basically acknowledging that their decline rates today are maybe 1.8 million barrels a day. Or maybe they're just, they're just being confusing. So how fast are the mature fields now declining? And then you come into a very important question. How are the Saudi Aramco new projects that were done between 2004 and 2006 actually performing? Uh, They've been so silent on that that I frankly am a little bit dubious that they've hit their targets. I think if they had hit their targets, they'd be a lot more forthcoming. And then, as, as Chris raised this morning, an enormous amount of the projects he has hit in his database that matter are, the, are these giant fields that are being rehabilitated where they basically think they'll get another 4 million barrels a day. And the question becomes, how likely is that? How likely is it going to happen on time? Or and every one of those projects are tough, complicated projects. There's a great article in Atlantic Monthly this month uh, called Gawar, Running Dry. And they use the fabulous data that Stuart Sanifier has put forward has done that many of you saw yesterday. Just this simple picture of Gawar and what it used to look like when, the, when North Gawar was he heavily saturated with the oil compared to the pockets of oil left behind is a picture's worth a thousand words. Saudi Arabia's candor also suggests that not as all well within the kingdom. I thought it was amazing uh, several months ago when oil prices had reached $75 a barrel, Ali Naim was, was quoted in the Oil Daily as saying, nobody seems to want our oil. And then I also think it is interesting to see the consistency with which senior spokesmen within Saudi Aramco are basically saying some of the increased output from the $70 billion spent is to replace declines from our mature fields. And then I listened to other senior Saudi Aramco officials that quietly say it would be folly to plan on producing more than 12 million barrels a day. Uh, and, and then I hear even others, seniors, say, I think we can hit maybe 10 and a half, but only for a matter of months, and then we'll be in decline. So to meet all these long-term projected demands that we looked at, Saudi's output has to grow, or some other source has to come out of thin air to replace it. There's also some troubling evidence that I look at every month. It happens to be Table 6 of the Oil Monthly Report of the International Energy Agency. And of all the numbers in the Oil Energy Agency's, International Energy Agency report, these are the only real hard data. It's exports to the IAA member countries, because it's an important reporting requirement of being a member of the IAA to actually report your imported oil by country of origin. And they report every month, Saudi light, Saudi medium, and Saudi heavy as it comes into the member countries of the IAA, which about 85% of the Saudi's exported oil. 
And it's just interesting to see the steady state of staying around four to four and a half million barrels a day. And then finally in 2003, they peak at 4.65 million barrels a day. And in the first six months of 2007, they're down to 3,920,000 barrels a day. The question is, are they shutting in supply? But were they shutting it in in 2004, 2005, 2006? Uh, or is that actually the arrival of the evidence that the mature fields are now into steady decline? And then I step back and I say, as I dug through all of this new data this fall, I said, you know, why didn't I find any good news? Because I actually look for it. Uh, well, perhaps the good news is hiding, or perhaps it's still on its way. Uh, perhaps big discoveries, uh, uh, you know, that were real just can't find rigs. I was addressing a, a very impressive group of the, of the sort of leading uh, next generation people at Chevron, who were all mentored by the Chevron fellows at a program on Tuesday afternoon. I basically went through this entire presentation as a dry run. And one of the comments that I got afterwards is we have some fabulous discoveries in the lower tertiary, and starting with the jack, but we cannot find a drilling rig. It might be three years before we can actually do the second test well on jack. Where are the rigs? Well, the rigs aren't going to be here for a long period of time. Uh, perhaps we had an unusually bad last few years. When I thought about the 42 skimpy new discoveries, I thought, well, if it takes six and a half years, we did have that awful period in 98 and 99 when people just froze. But on the other hand, we had the rig count up to basically 100% in 95, 96, and 97. Uh, it certainly wasn't due to a lack of spending at low prices. The e &P spending has soared in recent years. Uh, the, the major oil companies are now spending almost three times what they were four years ago. It wasn't through lack of drilling because every high quality rig in the world is now in use. And so unless some good news comes soon, I think we basically, frankly, ran out the clock. But coming soon, just around the corner, is the real risk, a clash between rising demand and shrinking supply. Because unless demand growth slows or begins to decline, or unless crude oil slippage suddenly starts to soar, then, my friends, demand will outpace supply. So we then have to come back to the whole card and say how ample are our winter inventories uh, and how fast can stocks drop before we breach minimum operating levels? And this is the single biggest risk, in my opinion, of the 21st century. And so while the newspapers have been loaded the last few months with the subprime loan debacle and global warming, these are basically ones and twos on a scale of 10 affecting our lives over the next two or three years, then getting through the winter of 2007-2008. Uh, can winter demand be met? Well, the IEA projects the fourth quarter to have demand at 87.8 million barrels a day and the first quarter at 88.2. And so basically, round that off at 88, at 88. And you say, can crude production that's been stalled and slightly declining at 74 down to 73 suddenly rise by two and a half to four million barrels a day? Can this other fuels, natural gas liquids, rise by that same amount? Or can our global system tolerate 180 days of a two and a half million barrel a day or greater stock draw, which is basically 450 million barrels, which should be the largest stock draw we've ever experienced during the winter. Let me just show you the stress in meeting 88 million barrels a day. The simple math is cause, in my opinion, for alarm. If crude oil is, is at 73, if NGLs, et cetera, stay at 12, then we basically have total supply of 85, and the 88 requires a 3 million barrel a day stock draw. I gave you the numbers of two and a half. What if demand's higher? What if crude supply continues to drop? How tight can elastic be pulled before it snaps is the question we need to be addressing today. Then we have another insidious above ground risk. Our system is frankly too old. Our oil and gas in infrastructure is rusty and too old. The oil service and drilling rigs are too old. Our refineries, our tank farms, our pipelines are too old, and our industry's workforce is rapidly graying, with no relief in sight on any of those issues. Where will added refinery throughput come from? If you take the world crude oil nameplate capacity in 2007 versus, versus the world's petroleum use, we now have a cushion of 1.7 million barrels a day refinery capacity. Port Arthur's Motiva refinery is scheduled to double its output over the next five to seven years to increase by 300,000 barrels a day at a cost of $7 billion. But I'd also point out that the core refineries at, at, in Port Arthur were built to support Spindletop, they're 105 years old. 
Kuwait's proposed refinery is now estimated to add, that's a brand new refinery, grassroots, six, 615,000 uh, uh, barrels a day at a cost of a staggering 14 to 16 billion dollars, and probably close to a decade to build. Our oil and gas infrastructure has to be rebuilt ASAP, as even if well head output can grow soon, the infrastructure will start to shrink if we don't rebuild our systems. So we need now refineries, pipelines, drilling rigs, and tank farms. And some are needed to support the potential growth just in case it can be supplied. But the balance, maybe 99%, is has to be done to ensure that our current flows continue. What would really be an inconvenient truth would be to end up five years from now with crude oil supply at, say, 68, 69 million barrels a day, which might be really good news, but find that we have an infrastructure that's collapsed that we can only get 40 million barrels a day through our pipes. And, we've, and we have our rigs that are basically two or three offshore rigs toppled because they're too old, and then we basically shut down about half the fleet while we rebuild. So this is going to be a big, big issue. And then I had this slide in already, and then I heard the, the, the numbers before the numbers before at lunch of this unbelievable soaring of all these raw material costs and these scarce resources. And I say, I think we realistically have to address the fact that if we tried to rebuild the system, do we have any concept of how many raw materials, raw resources that would, that would take? Uh, iron ore prices have doubled, copper prices have soared, the backlogs to get projects done gets longer each month, the lack of engineers is getting scary, the project costs are tripling, doubling or tripling, and so if we tried to do that, it would basically tax the workforce of the world probably as great as any project we've ever done. So finally, what happens when demand outpaces supply? Well, energy demand is fickle. It doesn't have any link to available supply. When demand is higher than supply, then inventories decline. But the problem is today's inventories are extremely low, as far as we know, on day's usage, and we still have no inventory stock data, period, outside the OECD, other than Singapore. Once minimum operating levels are breached, somebody runs short. That's the bottom line. When oil peaks, demand is unlikely to slow down, and peak oil then quickly turns into a Pearl Harbor event. And the likelihood of this occurrence rises with every passing month, because once shortages begin, Consumer human behavior is like clockwork. You can make a book on it. The users top up their tanks. And this leads to a classic run on the bank. And since the world has no accurate global fuel gauge, predicting this event's impossible. But literally, if we started at topping up the tanks, and I'm not talking just about automobiles. I'm talking about the rackers, the service stations, the ship channel uh, 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 vats. It could, we could probably drain our system in five or six days. And once we drained it, do the math. We could, until we shut down everyone using anything, we'd never get them rebuilt. So this is the danger that we're now headed into. You come back to the issue of above ground risk and the below ground risk, and frankly, I don't think it matters which one is the worst. Why does it matter why Chicago burned down? A fire literally destroyed Chicago in 1871. The rumor was the fire was caused by Catherine O'Leary's cow kicking over the lantern in the barn. After the fact, did it matter? If we run out of usable petroleum, will it matter whether it was caused by above or below ground risk materializing or a combination of both? Is it too late to create an early warning radar system? Had we had radar in Hawaii, we could have easily seen the Japanese air fleet and the US Navy fleet could have been saved, but we didn't. We, the world, can suddenly rise up if we want to and absolutely demand energy data reform. Field-by-field field production reports for the last 60 quarters on all key fields uh, uh, would actually resolve this problem and create a radar system. And let me tell you how we basically enact that. The OECD says anyone that wants to import oil into the OECD uh, that, that doesn't have cough up their mandatory field-by-field field reports gets slapped with a $20 per barrel transportation fine. And I will guarantee you with about three months you'd get the data. This data, I think within about a week of analysis, would end the peak oil debate, full stop. We'd see the planes on the horizon. Is there any downside to data reform? World oil leaders have amazingly to me shown zero interest in field-by-field -field data reports and the reasons they use, it's our confidential data, we might suffer competitive disadvantage, we're as transparent as everyone else. Well, let me tell you, there's been field-by-field -field production report in the North Sea for 30 years, and I've never heard an operator say, I was hurt by that report. In fact, I've been surprised how little they looked at it, or they would have seen the North Sea was peaking. 
Flying blind has extreme dangers. Once we crash, we will bitterly resent the lack of data reform. If we all win, if reform is enacted, and everyone loses if there's no reform. So if there's any one thing all of you could do when you leave here is, you know, call your congressman and say, we want data reform. Will peak oil surpass global warming as the 21st century's greatest challenge? If peak oil is imminent, it will be a crisis in 2008 to 2012. Global warming, if real, will not be a crisis for another 30 years at the outset. Most, most of the experts stuff I read say 50 to 100 years. If mitigating global warming risk has become the highest priority in the world, why are so few people worried about peak oil? Peak oil could actually solve global warming by creating a resource war that ends the 21st century. <laughs> so, in my opinion, and I hope I'm not being an alarmist, but I'm alarmed. <laughs> the peak oil risk is genuine. There is a chance that oil will not peak soon, but it's a small chance. It might stay at undulating plateaus for decades, but there's no evidence of that. But if all the public data that I keep going through argues that demand growth will not be met, the higher demand grows, the steeper oil will then decline. Gauging the risk of peak oil being imminent is far higher than our homes burning down and far bigger immediate impact to us than global warming. The risk might be 50%. It might be 75 to 90%. So it is time to take the peak oil risk seriously. Thank you. I appreciate that expression very much for, for all the work that Matt is doing. Um, we'll pop one question to him. Uh, it's my, my irascible colleague, uh, Randy Udall. $200 a barrel oil, will we see it in the next 15 years? I think you have a bet riding on that. I do. John Tyr Tyranny at the New York Times called me the Friday before the New York Times Sunday Magazine was coming out in the middle of, of August 2005, where the whole magazine was on me, Saudi Arabia's oil, and this book written. And he said, I've, I'm assuming you've read the final article. I said, yeah, I got it a couple of days ago. He said, I was really struck by your comment that we need to prepare ourselves for triple-digit oil, and I don't mean low triple-digit. He said, you weren't serious about that, were you? I said, yeah, I was. He said, do you remember when Julian Simon and Paul Ehrlich made this unbelievable commodity bet? So anyway, within a half an hour, his bottom line was, I want to publicly make you a bet. And, and uh, so uh, on, about four days later, there was a, his column in the New York Times called the $10,000 bet. Because we each put $5,000 on the line, and my bet was that by 2010, the average price of WTI would be over $200 a barrel, and his bet was under. Uh, I just made that number up. I said, since I said low triple, not, you know, triple digits and not low, I thought it was cheesy to say 110. Uh, <laughs> how hard would it be to get there? Uh, well, you know, it's amazing that when we were having that conversation, oil prices were 45 and they're now 88. Uh, I think it would be a lot easier to go from 88 to 200 than it was from 45 to 88. We're an event or two away from basically breaking through the magical 100 barrier, and then basically, uh, uh, the, the, the problem is there is no ceiling to stop the price. The one last thing I'll leave you with is just the simple fact that $90 a barrel sounds like a shocking number because we haven't ever seen it before, but when I translate that into a usable, consumable amount, it is 13 cents a cup. So refiners are still able to buy a scarce natural resource uh, at the cheapest price, we pay for anything. And so $200, $300 a barrel is not an expensive price. We will be there, and it will help us all. Thank you. <laughs>